morning. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You can see some beautiful flowers that are here in the front. Those are in memory of our beloved Rita, Donna DeRoach's mom. And we had that service here yesterday, and we're able to worship the Lord together as we celebrated her life. And uh, so that's what the flowers are. And then I just also wanted to mention to those of you that have chose to um, read through the Bible in a year or about a year, I want to just encourage you to stay faithful to that. I know sometimes we can get a little bit behind, uh, and we just want to throw it, throw the idea out the, out the window, but that's, that's what Satan would want us to do. Just pick up where you left off and just keep trucking along. So what if it takes you a little bit more than a year? Um, it, that's, that's just normal, so it's okay. But uh, keep up the good work of moving in that direction where God's word is just kind of being, you're soaking in, in his truth. We talk often about how important that is. Let's just take a moment and pray before we uh, move back to our series here. Father, we pray that even now in the quietness of this moment, when we step away from the routines of our lives and the routines of the world to worship and to focus on you, even now in this quietness, O oh God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and speak to our hearts through the truth of your word. I pray, O oh God, that we would leave this place different than the way we came in. Lord, we would be able to leave and say deep in our hearts that we met with Jesus today. And Jesus has done a new work in us. We will give you all the glory and praise. We ask this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. So we're in a, just started last week, a series on living beyond ourselves. In other words, living life now under the control and the power of God rather than living life in our own strength as a follower of Jesus. Now, last week I took you to Ephesians chapter 1 because there we have this beautiful picture of how uh, salvation works, how we cross over from being apart from God to now being in fellowship with God. And uh, we know from Scripture that uh, sin, which started in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and go on what they thought was best, that's when sin entered into the world, uh, we know from Scripture that we all are sinners. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. And it doesn't matter, matter whether you have five sins in all of your life and I maybe have 105 sins in my life, one sin separates us from the righteousness and the holiness of God. Now, how, do, how, do, how does that get taken care of? That's what we looked at last week. We need to be redeemed because we're slaves of sin. Someone needs to buy us back, and only Jesus can do that. Because Jesus came to earth, and as the Son of God, he lived a perfect life. And he died a perfect death on the cross on our behalf. He didn't have any sin. 
So that means that Jesus died on that cross as our substitute. He was dying for us. Now, when we put our faith, when we put our trust in what Jesus did for us, the Bible says that now we move into new life, life in Christ. Our sins are forgiven. The Bible uses the word justification, which means that when I put my trust in Jesus and his death on the cross for me, my life becomes justified, which means Jesus places, God places the righteousness of Jesus upon my heart and my soul. All my sins, all your sins are taken care of at the cross. The problem is we continue to live in this world. And though our hearts are made right with Jesus and our, we have a spiritual life now, we still have that fleshly part of us. We're not fully redeemed. We will be when we walk, when we walk into heaven, and Scott's gonna, Pastor Scott's going to explain that to us in a couple of weeks. But at this point, there's this war that goes on inside of our lives. I want to be the person that Jesus wants me to be. But there's this fleshly pull in my life that there are things that I know are wrong, but I continue to be pulled towards those things. Well, we want to learn, as followers of Jesus, how to live beyond that fleshly side of ourselves. And that's what this series is about. Because last week we noticed that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus that Jesus now comes by his spirit and dwells within us. Okay, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. Remember we talked about the Holy Spirit sealing us. Nobody can remove us from the hand of God. So, that's the, the, the direction that we're, we're going in. I want to read to you a verse or two out of the book of 1 Thessalonians, more specifically in chapter 5. And when I read this to you, there's going to be a word in the first verse that you might not quite understand. It's not a word that we're very familiar with, but it's the word sanctify. Okay? And when you hear the word sanctify or you see that in Scripture... What that means is that God wants to bring us into a place of wholeness. Right now, our lives are fragmented. Remember, we got the flesh, we got God the Spirit living in us, and there are still these struggles that go on. We're fragmented people. But God, out of his love for us, wants to make us whole. And so when we're whole, our, our lives, the focus of our lives is no longer on I or us, but rather it's now set on God and his plan for our lives. That's what sanctify means. So, beginning at verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says this, Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body, in other words, all of you, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 24. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Now notice carefully here that God, God himself, who is the author and sustainer of our peace, this God wants to, to help transform our life into one of fullness, one of purpose, one of satisfaction. But it's all going to be wrapped with a cord of peace. Because God is the author of peace. He could have said there uh, that, that, that the God of all righteousness or, or, or the God of all forgiveness is going to do this. But notice he 
chooses the word peace, the God of peace. So he wants to transform us into men and women and youth and children who live this life in his peace. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So who is going to do the work of transforming us? Who is going to go about producing this change, which is a process in us that moves us from a a, a life of turmoil to an ungirded life of peace? It says here that the God of peace himself holds that responsibility. In fact, this verse really gets clarified by verse 24, just a a, a verse down, or two verses down, that says this. He who calls you is faithful. So we've got God who is a God of peace. We've got God who is a God of faithfulness. And then it says this. He will surely do it. Now, what does that mean that God's going to do it? The author of peace who calls you and I to himself and the author of peace who who calls you to live a life that's beyond yourself but a life that's lived in truth, this same God is the one who by your consent and by my consent, wants to live his life in us and then through us. Your life as God's son, your life as God's daughter, is not a manufacturing plant where where you strive to work and you strive to do your best and You work hard to live by God's standards in your own doing. Our text here explains to us that whatever God longs for from us, the kind of life that he longs from us, can only be generated, can only be completed, can only be accomplished by him doing the work. And he says what? He says, I am will do it. That's a promise. Right? That's a promise. God said, he will do it. God can't lie. So the one who calls you and I to love him above all other things, the God who calls us to love Others above ourselves is the one, according to Scripture, who by your consent accomplishes and executes that reality. Self-effort, good deeds, self-perseverance are not part of the equation when it comes to living the Christian life. The Christian life is God himself as our power source. Because if he's not our power source, then following Jesus and living the Christian life is one of utter frustration. And some of you are right on the edge of saying, I can't do this, I give up. And that's exactly what Satan wants from you. And what Scripture is trying to teach us and what Jesus is trying to teach us in his truth is, listen, I want to give you a whole life. I want to give you purpose. But you can't manufacture it. I have to do it in you, and then I'll be able to do it through you. He who calls you is faithful. 
he will surely do it. You see, it's not, it's not Jesus plus my willpower. It's not Jesus plus the church plus me. It's not Jesus plus my intellect and my ideas and my opinions. No, it's Jesus only. Jesus only living his life in me. That is true Christianity. So as we learn to empty ourselves, empty our task-driven nature before Jesus, it's then that he is able to come and set us free, not just from ourselves, but even from Satan himself, even from the devil himself. It says in Scripture, doesn't it, that, that you and I, as followers of Jesus, are more than conquerors. For even death itself has been conquered by Christ's life. In fact, it says in Hebrews, Christ, excuse me, through death, destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And so when I empty myself of all my willpower and all my personal resolve and all this inner drive, it's then that Jesus is able to come in and fill me with himself so that now we become human vehicles of the divine life. But we're not the engine. We're just the shell of the car. Our trust in Jesus opens the windows of heaven because God moves in and he makes his home in our life. And when that happens, when I say, Jesus, I have nothing, I am nothing, all I can do is get on my knees and rely upon you, It's then that he comes in, he dwells within us, and the impossible becomes the possible. And that's exactly why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. It's died. Behold, the new has come. A new creation, a new way of living has fallen upon us. I think there are too many of us in the church that are still living in the past reality of life rather than believing that Jesus has made us new. Because, you see, newness implies the eradication of the old. It's gone. It's past. It's done. And too many of us live in the shadows of our old life, and we don't allow the God of peace to come in and take control so that new life and supernatural life and divine life now becomes our experience. And so often the reason we don't do that is because we still want to be the focus of ourselves. We got too much I in us. And that's why we're no different than Adam and Eve. We think we know better than God. You see, the grasp of sin, the the idol of me, the heart of self-centeredness, the heart of pride should never be allowed to be the engine that controls my life because those created fuels become diluted and useless over time. And God has something so much better for us. And he says, listen, 
It's okay. The past is the past. But the new has come. And so now I have not just a new home and a new life in Christ, but I have a new landlord. And this landlord is for me. He's not against me. Jesus now becomes for me what I could never be for myself. It's a beautiful relationship. At least that's what it's meant to be. Jesus says in John chapter 15, he says, he says, listen, let, let, let me just paint a picture for you of, of, of what this kind of relationship is, is supposed to look like. And he He's talking to the disciples and the followers of him in that day. And he says, listen, it's like I'm the vine and you are the branches. And he says, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, listen, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Abiding, that word abiding, means to remain in place. A, a branch will only produce vegetation. It will only produce fruit if it's remaining to the source of life, which is the vine. You... you, you, you see the apple on the apple tree in the fall. And you see that that apple's hanging from a branch. And the branch, through its supernatural way, is feeding that apple. But if you were to go and somehow cut off the source of nutrients going to the apple, what's going to happen? It's going to die. And, and when it dies, it's going to fall off the tree, and it's going to be useless. And, and, and Jesus is trying to paint that picture for us. He's like, listen, if you just hold on to me and let my life be in you and through you, then you'll experience real life. The apple doesn't work hard at hanging from that branch, right? I've never seen an apple like, got to make this work, got to do this, got to be there, got to give that. No, what does the apple do? It just remains there. It abides in its place. But it's, it's necessary that it's fed from the vine itself, otherwise it's going to die. So as I stay in this position as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, under the guidance and the leadership of his truth, it's then that my life takes on life and becomes now meaningful and purposeful. Because, you see, he becomes not just the fruit of my life, but he becomes the fruit producer. He becomes the fruit producer. So I abide, he generates. I abide, he creates. I abide, he produces. I abide, he manufactures. I abide, he delivers. I abide, he supplies. How much, how much can Jesus do through a life that surrendered to him today? How much can Jesus do 
in a life that surrendered to him today. Everything. Everything. Jesus is limited only by the means of your availability to all that he makes available to us. Paul said this to the church at Colossae. He's talking about Jesus, and he says, In him, in Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. Now, don't miss the next line. And we are complete in him. We are complete in him. Are you in Christ this morning? Have you put your trust and your faith in Christ for your salvation? If so, then you are, by Scripture itself, complete in him. The Greek word for complete simply means full. So when you fill a glass with water, what that means is now it's full and you can't put anything else in it. And that's what God promises to do in us when we receive the gift of of Jesus. He fills us with himself. And as we saw last week, his very spirit comes, unzips us, fills us up with Jesus, and then zips us back up, and we are sealed forever. You see, when you and I can grasp and understand and believe the truth of, of the scriptures that we're seeing, it's then that the Christian life is no longer a duty, but now it's a delight. Because the apple simply is abiding. The life is simply abiding. And now we're experiencing the fruits of Jesus living in us and through us. And it's, 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 it's not us. And we know it's not us when this is working. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. What then is the, the key to unlock this life? What is the key that unlocks this precious and powerful truth? Well, it's the same key that rescued us from being separated from God. It's faith. It's faith. It's trust. It's confidence. Paul said in, in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, he said, the just, the righteous. So those are people who have now crossed over the line. Okay, we're not talking about the lost. We're talking about you and I, people who have crossed over the line and put our faith in Christ. It says the just, the righteous will live by faith. And so what that means is faith starts the Christian life, but faith maintains the Christian life. And we stated last week that, that this idea of having faith or having belief or having confidence is more than just acquiring facts. Remember I said you came in and, and you looked at the chair that you were going to sit on and you, and you thought that through and you thought, yep, that looks like it's been manufactured pretty well. It's got, yeah, pretty good looking legs on it. 
uh, looks sturdy. Um, I'm, I'm fairly confident that that chair would hold me. Is that faith? No, that's not faith. That's acquiring facts. Faith came when you sat on the chair and trusted fully that it was now holding you. That's faith. And so, when we take God at his word, when we say, I I'm just going to trust God, I, I can't do this life. I can't make it work. I'm just going to put my confidence in what his word says, the promises of his word. When you get to that point, your responsibility and my responsibility is but one thing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You never meant for me to live this Christian life in my own strength. Never meant for me to manufacture it grow it, power it. I'm living in your strength today. And what your word promises, I will choose to believe and I will choose to trust. So, thank you. A life of thank you to Jesus is a lot less stressful than a life that says, I've got to get this together. I've got to make this right. I've got to make this work. And you see, once I take my eyes off of Jesus, once I take my eyes off of his truth, once I start to go back to relying on my, my power and my intellect and my assets, it's then that I begin once again the downward descent. what I'm hoping and praying for my own life and for each of your lives is that together we would see and understand and believe and treasure that Jesus himself is adequate for every life situation we will meet because Jesus is for us and not against us. There's no pressure. There's no problem. There's no responsibility. There's no temptation. There's no heartache in which Jesus is not adequate to handle. And when we apply this truth to our lives, when I simply allow Jesus to be Jesus in me, it's then and only then that I can begin to live out some other words that are found in 1 Thessalonians, and that is, in everything, give thanks. Do you see how the two go hand in hand? Or even the words of Romans 8, we know that in all things. Could somebody just give me a definition of all? All. All. This is why he was a scholar in college. <laughs> we, we, you're right. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those, for the good of those, for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul paints a word picture for us when he says to the church in Ephesus, he says, listen, he says, let me, let me give you an idea of what this looks like, what we're talking about this morning. And he says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. When a person is drunk, there's a power that's Produce and that power takes over, it consumes, it controls, it influences, it restrains. And God says, don't be managed. Don't allow your life to be managed with substance. 
be controlled by the very spirit of the living God because that is what will bring you joy and satisfaction and fullness to your life. So when I allow God's spirit to to occupy my heart, what is my heart? It's my thoughts, my emotions, my choices, my actions. When I allow God to just come in and consume me, it's then that I have the life that I was created to have. Notice in the Gospel of John how Jesus describes the Holy Spirit. He's again talking to the disciples, and he hasn't yet risen back to heaven. Uh, he's, he, he's come back to physically be with them to show that he is indeed alive. And so he's saying here in essence that the Holy Spirit is going to come and, and take his place. He's not going to physically be any longer on earth, but his spirit's going to be here. But notice what he says in John chapter 14. He says, these things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You know what that says to me? What that says to me is that Jesus knew in a very practical way that every life, every human being, every man, every woman needs a helper. A helper to live the life that we're living in this world. And so when uh, sickness comes, when life situations come, when tragedy comes, when cancer comes, when loneliness comes, when bills come, when exams come, when Monday morning comes, what is it that we need? I need a helper because the fleshly part of me doesn't have it. And what the world wants to give to me is TV personalities and self-help books and drugs and alcohol and vacations and, and, and toys. Those are the helpers of the world. But why would we choose those things when we can access the very life of the risen Savior who never changes but who actually is living inside of us. Andrew Murray sums it up quite well when he says this. He says, God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life wholly yielded or surrendered to him. He who calls you is faithful. And he will surely do it. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would continue to instill this truth into our lives, into our souls, into our hearts. That it would not just be words written on a page, but that it would be a reality that's experienced in each one of our lives. Every one of us here this morning, Father, is facing some kind of difficulty, some kind of situation, some kind of experience that has, for whatever reason, come and now been part of our life story.
And God, we so need to rest on those words that you've given us. That by your spirit, you've come to be our helper. In fact, you've come to live your life in us, a life that we cannot live on our own. We don't have the power to love unconditionally on our own. We don't have the power to, to give to others on our own. We don't have the power to even understand why things are the way they are. But God, you've given us the very spirit of Jesus to dwell within us. Your word reminds us that you want to take all those things in life and work them out for our good and for your glory. And so this morning as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the death and life of you, Lord Jesus, as we pause to remember the life that you gave on our behalf, the blood that you shed to cover our sins, Lord, might we remember this morning that you accomplished that because you deeply love us. And because you deeply love us, you have a perfect plan for our lives. And though sometimes those plans have content of hard, hardship and suffering. We know, Lord, from your, from your word that you're still using all of those things for our good. You're going to make us more deeply rooted and anchored in you, Lord Jesus. And so I pray that you would give us the ability to understand that and to believe that. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. The elements that are before us, the wafer and the cup, are symbols of the life of Jesus that's been broken for us on the cross. The cup represents the blood that's, the lifeblood that's been spilled out for the covering of our sin. They're symbols, but they represent a beautiful reality. That Jesus' love is a sacrificial love. When you look at the cross, you recognize just how much Jesus really does love you. He died in your place. He took care of your sin so that you could now live the life that he's created you to live. If your faith and trust is in Jesus, then the scripture invites us to come to partake of these elements in remembrance of him. And so I would invite you to come and take the wafer, take the cup, take it back to your seat, take it off to the side. But this is really an opportunity for you to do business with Jesus and to worship him personally by giving thanks to him for what he's done on your behalf. So you come when you're ready and partake of the elements. <laughs>